All right, sounds good. So um, welcome everyone. And sorry that I missed you all in the spring. So it turns out the Black Death lecture had to be uh, canceled because of a pandemic. Who would have thought? Um, and so, so that's the big elephant in the room right now, the current pandemic that we are living through. Um, and I uh, will be touching on, of course, the history of pandemics uh, throughout the lecture series here. Um, and we're going to be getting into modern epidemiology as well in the third uh, lecture in this, uh, this series here. So we will get into a little bit of uh, the comparisons with the current environment with COVID. Uh, so, uh, but the first couple of lectures are primarily going to be focused on uh, the history of epidemics and of course, the Black Death specifically. Um, so I do want to preface all of this by saying that uh, I'm not a doctor, so I am not an epidemiologist, I am a historian, uh, so I won't necessarily be able to answer all of the specifics of the current uh, epidemic, um, but we will at least get into some comparisons a little bit later on. And so to get started, um, so we're getting into the Black Death, um, which is the single uh, most deadly pandemic in all of history. It actually dwarfs all other single outbreaks uh, of disease. In fact, um, during the Black Death, there could have been upwards of 200 million people uh, who died globally. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit about what led up to all of that, why it was so awful. So what paved the way for that? But in this first um, lecture, we're going to be discussing the history of diseases and how diseases affect history. And so I want to get into that specifically. So disease and history. So disease is one of the most powerful forces in all of human history. And it often doesn't get the credit, if we want to call it that, uh, that it deserves in shaping human society and culture. And of course, affecting our everyday lives, which is something that's pretty rich for me to say while we're living through a pandemic here. But nonetheless, we tend to like to emphasize human agency in history and think that all historical events are related to our triumphs or our failures. But the truth of the matter is that disease can sometimes take away from human agency and make us feel helpless and sort of resigned to our fates. Um, so we see that throughout history, people tend to uh, downplay disease, often preferring to focus on things that are within our control, uh, things like war, things like uh, political decisions, things like that, that we have control over. Um, so, but throughout this lecture, we're going to be talking about the disease itself, how that affects history, and um, how it just shapes history as we know it. And you could also make the argument that um, it's something that brings out the true nature of human, uh, human beings and human society when something horrific like a pandemic hits. So we'll be getting into all of that as well. And so um, when you're looking at the screen right here, and you might have some questions about some of the pictures that I've included. Uh, and on the left side of the screen, you'll see Albrecht Durer's uh, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The reason that I've included this here is because The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse relates uh, to the Black Death here, because if you're familiar with this sort of trope, the four horsemen, uh, you know that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are um, war, famine, pestilence and death. And they're all related to one another. And um, there's a correlation amongst them. So um, one often causes the other. And we'll see that uh, throughout this lecture series that oftentimes you start with a war, then you end up with a famine, and then you end up with a plague. And they all play off of one another and make each other worse. And what ultimately ends up happening uh, is what 
you see in the picture in the upper right there. So the picture in the upper right is the triumph of uh, death by Bruegel. And um, and so, uh, so it's a pretty bleak uh, outlook here. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about what you're seeing at the bottom in the bottom picture there as well, which is um, is the plague. OK, so a picture of plague bacteria. And um, so I'm going to take a look at the Q&A and um, and if I can, let's see. Oh, go full screen there. I will do that. So just a minute. Um, let's see. And I will go to full screen. There we go. All right, hopefully that's a little bit better there. All right, so in moving on, um, we're gonna be talking about diseases throughout history. And I want to start with um, various periods in human evolution and human history and talk about some of the major diseases that we see uh, during these various periods. We're gonna be going through the prehistoric diseases, getting into Bronze Age diseases, diseases of the Hellenistic world, the Roman world, and then working our way up to the Black Death. And so when we're looking at prehistoric diseases here, we have to consider where human beings um, first developed. And of course, humans are developing in tropical and subtropical areas in Africa and likely started out with the same types of diseases that affected monkeys and apes. And one of our oldest foes in terms of disease uh, is actually malaria. So malaria is one of the oldest human diseases. It's been around for about a hundred million years. We've actually found evidence of malaria um, in mosquitoes uh, trapped in amber. And, um, and so this area here in sub-Saharan Africa seems to be the epicenter for the development and spread of malaria and other tropical diseases diseases because um, diseases tend to flourish in the tropics for the exact same reasons that people did and do. So we have this warm, wet, diverse environment that allows viruses and bacteria to survive on their own. So even if they rarely come into contact with a host, that's okay they can just wait around. It's comfortable there. So that's why diseases are developing in the tropics. And, um, and so in addition to all of that, once we move from the tropics, move from the trees down to the savanna there, um, these diseases that require moist, warm conditions um, start to decline slightly, but then we end up with diseases that are associated with the herds of of the savanna. So we end up with things like sleeping sickness that's transferred by um, tsetse flies. And uh, sleeping sickness is something that's such an effective check on human population that it's probably the only reason that various herds of African savanna uh, or of the African savannas have survived up to this point. Um, basically, people can't live near them, at least not for long. And so so human beings eventually became so skilled at hunting that um, we became the apex predators. And so we had very little to fear from other animals. And disease was one of the few things that could actually check the human population and maintain homeostasis. And so, um, <clears throat> so when we look at the um, abundance of all of the parasites, all of the diseases that exist in uh, sub-Saharan Africa there, it lends credence to the idea that uh, it's the cradle of human civilization. And this is because there's nowhere else in the world that we see um, such diverse, elaborate, and efficient efficient diseases. Basically, as soon as the disease becomes uh, 
uh, more effective, uh, human beings start to develop immunities. But as soon as we develop immunities, well, then the diseases start to level up as well. And so we play off of each other, just learning from each other's weaknesses. And we often like to think that we are the ones who are studying diseases, that it is a one-way street there. We study diseases here. But when you think about it, in some ways, the diseases are studying us as well. So they are looking for our weaknesses. They're looking for loopholes to try to uh, exploit for their own survival here. And, um, and so with all of that in mind, human beings eventually start to migrate out of sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it's no accident that we see our numbers increasing exponentially once we start to move to more temperate uh, environments. And um, when we move to these temperate environments, we create these sorts of micro environments that are suitable to our survival. Because when you think about it, human beings are tropical creatures, all right? We are meant to live in the tropics. And um, if you don't think so, I challenge you to walk around in the snow in your birthday suit. All right, it's not gonna be very comfortable for you. We are meant to live in the tropics and we like to create tropical environments for ourselves everywhere we go. That's why we wear clothing. That's why we create shelter. That's why we use fire. We're creating our own little tropical environments. And so when we move into temperate uh, environments and create our own little micro environments, we assume that, all right, we've just gamed the system right here. We have our perfect little environment without all those pesky parasites. Life is good. Okay, what could possibly go wrong? And at least at the beginning, not much did. So hunter gatherers who had just moved into these temperate zones were incredibly healthy. So they're very, very robust and they are uh, unlikely to die of disease. So when hunter gatherers die, more often than not, they are dying from some horrible accident, maybe dying in childbirth, or in some cases dying from starvation, but they rarely die of disease because they've, again, gamed the system, moved out of that area there. And so now, now that we think, all right, well, surely we're safe. We're good to go. We figured it out. Well, then we decided that we'd start settling down. All right, we're gonna start settling down, having farms. We're gonna start developing irrigation systems and living in close quarters with one another. And that's what brings me to Bronze Age diseases here. All right. So um, when we settle down into this agrarian lifestyle, start developing villages, start developing city life, we see a proliferation of new types of diseases and parasites, ones that hadn't affected hunter -gatherer or our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And so um, we're living close to one another, we are living close to domesticated animals, and anytime you're living in that close of proximity to other human beings and lots and lots of other animals, you're also living in close proximity to lots and lots and lots of feces, all right? And that leads to problems. So early settlements were plagued by intestinal parasites of various sorts. And along with those came new waterborne illnesses, which were the direct result of innovations in irrigation and um, water that was contaminated by schistosomes. I know what you thought I was going to say, but schistosomes. So this water that was contaminated by schistosomes, they are called uh, or caused a disease called uh, schistosomiasis. And you can actually see the life cycle of one of those schistosomes or blood flukes in the little chart uh, on the slide there. So um, essentially what happens here is that 
Uh, there are little schistosomes called, uh, that are basically flatworms, okay, teeny tiny little flatworms that reproduce within snails and then make their way out of those snails into the water source there, and then they can be absorbed through our skin. Uh, so you don't necessarily even need to drink the water. It doesn't necessarily have to come into contact with an open wound. You can just wade into the water and absorb absorb these things through your skin, which is horrifying. And once you absorb them through your skin, um, they cause all kinds of problems, mostly problems with your liver, problems with your uh, urinary tract, your bladder. And um, the most common effect of all of this that ancient peoples could see uh, was that they would end up with blood in their urine. In fact, this was so common that in ancient Egypt, it was considered a rite of passage to have blood in your urine. So you finally come of age if you have come down with uh, schistosomiasis here. And, um, and interestingly enough, this is a disease or ailment that still affects about a quarter of a billion people today, okay? So it's still around, it's still affecting people in tropical areas and people who don't have access to the medicine uh, that can treat all of this. And so this is something going all the way back to Bronze Age civilizations here. But when it comes to some of the other Bronze Age civilizations, one of the first ones that comes to mind uh, is ancient Mesopotamia. So we think about ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Sumer, and um, unfortunately, we know very, very little about disease in ancient Mesopotamia. And the reason for that is because um, bodies were not very well preserved there, so we don't really have uh, the bodies to look at. Um, the other issue that we have in ancient Mesopotamia is that they were culturally much more likely to focus focus on uh, diseases being caused by the gods. So instead of um, saying, uh, instead of say, describing a disease or focusing on how it affects another human being, they would focus on the wrath of the gods or emphasize that um, a she-devil, so a she-devil named uh, Lamashtu had come down and smote human beings with this disease here. And um, Oh, and I saw that uh, I had some hands raised. So I'm willing to answer a couple of questions here. Any, any hands raised? Yes. Ed, do you have mm -hmm. a question? Ed, do you have a question? Okay, Dennis, do you have a question? Dennis? Oh, I, okay, well, we'll try again. Okay, and I'll also have a couple of minutes at the end of the lecture uh, if you uh, think of your questions then, and I, I can certainly answer those, okay? And, um, oh, I just saw that uh, Dennis is unmuted. So uh, did you have your question? Dennis? No question. Oh, okay. All right. Well, in moving on, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> about disease in ancient Egypt, because um, we know considerably more about diseases coming out of ancient Egypt than we do about practically anywhere else uh, in the Bronze Age. And there are a couple of reasons why we know so much about diseases in ancient Egypt. Uh, one of those reasons is mummification. Okay, so they preserved the bodies. Um, and so we can actually study the bodies and see how they were affected by disease. Um, not only were they uh, preserving bodies, but they were including information about diseases and about medical care uh, in their art. You can actually see an example of that in, uh, on the slides there. So examples of diseases and examples of uh, apothecaries at the bottom 
bottom. And so they tell us that they also ex uh, expressly describe diseases uh, in hieroglyphics and in demotic as well. And um, so we know lots and lots of details about disease coming out uh, of Egypt there. In fact, we know that they were affected by diseases like polio, um, influenza, smallpox, tuberculosis, among many, many others. Uh, so lots of information coming out of Egypt. We also see some information coming out of other religious texts uh, from the ancient Near East. So you may have heard of this little religious text called the Old Testament. Uh, and we see evidence of disease coming out of that. So we see uh, evidence from the book of Exodus, for example. So it's possible that sometime around 1500 BCE, um, a disease struck uh, Egypt, killing all of the firstborn children and firstborn cattle for that matter. And of course, when we're looking at it in terms of uh, the Old Testament, it's going to be chalked up to divine intervention there. But epidemiologists and historians look at this and think, hmm, what if this were perhaps a disease? It's hard to say. And the um, Old Testament is even more explicit about all of this in the book of Samuel, because in the book of Samuel, we're told that around uh, 1140 BCE, the Israelites go into battle with the uh, Philistines, and we see that war and pestilence connection here. They go into battle with the Philistines, and the Philistines abscond with the Ark of the Covenant and go from one city to the next to the next. And everywhere that they go, they are plagued by pestilence until finally the Philistines decide that they should give the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelites there, but not before about 50 thousand people had died. So we see examples of this in the Old Testament. We also see some evidence of public health awareness in um, religious texts from this time. So if we think about things like kosher law, for example, um, it includes various dietary restrictions. So restrictions on eating pork or restrictions on eating uh, shellfish. And these dietary restrictions restrictions are related, again, to public health, because at this time in history, you were much more likely to come down with uh, bacterial infections or diseases uh, from eating things like pork uh, or shellfish. And so, um, so we see those dietary uh, restrictions continuing through Judaism, Christianity, later on Islam, and other religions as well. And so um, now we also start to see, let's see, let me get this to progress. Well, there we go. Okay. Uh, we, <clears throat> as we move on, uh, to the uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, progressing on to the classical period here, the accounts of plagues become much more detailed. And perhaps one of the most famous uh, examples of a plague in the Hellenistic world uh, is the plague of Athens. And the plague of Athens is yet another example of that connection between war and disease, and to a certain extent, famine as well. So the plague of Athens occurred at the height of the Peloponnesian War, and um, which is, of course, the war between Sparta and Athens, or the Delian League and the Peloponnesian League there. And you can think of Athens as being predominantly a naval power, and Sparta priding itself on its um, the strength of its army. And so if you have navy on one side and army on the other, um, it makes it very difficult for the two of them to compete with one another on equal ground because they fight very differently. And so the Athenian general Pericles thought that he had come up with a solution to this um, stalemate here. He decided that he was going to take the entire population of Attica, which is all of Athens and the surrounding countryside, and um, put them inside the Athenian walls for uh, protection. 
So he thought that if they're inside the Athenian walls, all of his uh, civilians are protected there, and then the Navy can just concentrate on battering the coast there and fighting the Spartans. So it seems like it would be a decent idea. But unfortunately, when you put tons and tons of people inside the walls there in crowded conditions, uh, living in squalor, oftentimes diseases break out. And so the disease that breaks out in Athens here has far-reaching uh, consequences. So if you had asked someone in the year 430 BCE uh, who was going to win the Peloponnesian War, almost everyone would have put their money on Athens, okay? They definitely would have put their money on the Delian League because um, it's just, it's bigger, it's better equipped. Um, they had the upper hand up to that point, but disease changed all all of this. So, um, and fortunately, we have very detailed accounts uh, of the disease that's coming out uh, or that is affecting Athens at this time. So detailed accounts coming directly from Thucydides. So Thucydides was an Athenian uh, historian who was living within the city walls while the plague hit Athens. He actually gets the plague himself, and um, but manages to live through it. And so according to Thucydides, this plague um, started in Ethiopia and it spread through Egypt and then across the Mediterranean and eventually into Greece. And um, historians and epidemiologists alike believe this plague may have killed somewhere between one third and two thirds of the Athenian population. And um, so even though the Peloponnesian War dragged on for about 27 years after all of that, you could argue that the plague is what lost the war for Athens. So it killed a huge percentage of their population and demoralized everybody else and destroyed their navy and prevented them from striking a decisive blow uh, against Sparta. And so now the big question is, what was it? So what the heck was this disease that killed so many Athenians and changed the course of the Peloponnesian War? Well, I mentioned that Thucydides is writing on this and he has, he's actually describing the uh, symptoms in detail. But unfortunately, Thucydides gives so many symptoms that it's difficult to nail down exactly what disease this may have been because he describes it as um, people getting a rapid uh, rapid onset of a fever, okay, and fever could apply to so many different diseases. He says that people were extremely thirsty, um, they had a bloody tongue and throat and red skin, and that um, as the disease progressed, they would break out into pustules and ulcers, and um, they'd have redness around the eyes, just sort of perpetual redness in their eyes. And so this led scholars to believe that this may have been a particularly virulent form of scarlet fever, strangely enough. So, um, so, and I say strangely enough, because when we think about um, devastating plagues, um, most of the time people don't think, oh yeah, scarlet fever. Um, and so, but it may very well have been the first instance uh, or outbreak of scarlet fever in Europe. So that is a possibility. However, like I said, it's very difficult to nail down what uh, what exactly this was. Uh, so historians have also guessed that it might be typhus or typhoid fever, um, because both of these are associated with people being in crowded conditions and living in squalor. In fact, the university in Athens um, extracted tooth pulp from Athenian plague victims there and came to the conclusion that it was typhus. But then this was later disputed um, by other scholars who said that their methodology was flawed. And so we don't really know. Um, the other theory is that this was a, um, 
a hemorrhagic virus similar to Ebola, and um, which is also a possibility, especially when we consider certain symptoms uh, like having a bloody tongue, bloody throat, uh, red eyes, and um, all of those are symptomatic of Ebola or hemorrhagic viruses. And they did say that this was something that was spread from Ethiopia into uh, Egypt and then Greece there. We know that the Athenians had been trading with the Ethiopians for years before this, especially for ivory to build up uh, the, uh, the statue of Athena. Uh, in the, at the Acropolis there. And so it's possible that through these trade connections there with Ethiopia, it may, may have gotten some sort of hemorrhagic virus. And, um, and so the jury's out on that, at least for now. And that will be the case for some of the other diseases that we discuss uh, throughout the lecture, where um, there are lots of questions about them, because it's quite possible that it could have been multiple diseases or uh, it's possible that it could be a disease that is extinct now. All right, so an ancient disease that we just don't have anymore. So it's difficult to even study it. And so um, now I want to talk a little bit about diseases in ancient Rome. So uh, before getting into those diseases in ancient Rome, though, I want to talk about just how clean the Romans are, because cleanliness and sanitation are going to play a major role in the Black Death later, or at least I should say lack of cleanliness and sanitation is going to play a major role. So. Just to start, public health and sanitation were more advanced in the year 300 AD than they were again until the 19th century. Okay, just think about that for just a minute here, that, uh, that Roman sanitation was superior to sanitation in Victorian England. Um, and so I want to talk about what goes into that superior sanitation, why it is that the Romans were so clean. And um, it all goes back to water. Okay, access to clean water and lots of it. So Romans had um, drainage systems that would eventually become modern sewer systems. And this went along with an elaborate system of waterworks uh, connected to the aqueducts. So Romans had indoor plumbing, they had flushing toilets uh, and public toilets, public urinals. Um, and um, we don't really see lavatories like that, again, until London's uh, great uh, ex uh, exhibition in the mid 19th century. So Romans have toilets and we don't get toilets again until the 19th century here. And so I emphasize um, waterworks because of course, cleanliness depends on your water supply and Romans uh, or Roman aqueducts provided about 250 million gallons of clean water to the city daily. Okay, just think about that 250 million gallons of water being pumped into Rome daily. And um, after we account for baths taking up about half of that, there's still about 50 gallons per head for all of the 2 million people who are living in the middle of Rome. So using 50 gallons of water a day in ancient Rome is very similar to say what people might use in a modern city like New York or London. And so with all of that water, uh, Roman citizens are able to, one, take baths, okay? So they take baths pretty regularly as well. They're able to keep themselves clean. They're able to drink clean water. They're able to cook with clean water, wash their dishes, wash their clothes, clean their homes. And then the city itself, the Roman government, actually... Um, <clears throat> Uh, funded uh, sanitation within the city. So, and by that, I mean that every single evening you would have a crew go through the streets there and sweep the streets and then rinse them off and scrub them. So the city of Rome was cleaner than a lot of cities 
are today uh, in developed nations. So it's it's pretty impressive stuff here. And um, and so when it comes to personal hygiene, um, Roman citizens uh, have a level of hygiene that we don't really see again until about the uh, mid 20th century. So again, to put that into perspective, a Roman citizen living during the reign of Hadrian um, was probably cleaner than my great grandparents were uh, living in Appalachia in the United States. Okay, so that's just how clean Romans were. Now, on top of all of the sanitation here, there were also practices about uh, what to do with dead bodies. Okay, Romans were notoriously or famously perhaps squeamish about dead bodies. So, which who can blame them? They don't want to see all of that sitting around, rotting, grossing everyone out. And so um, they mandated that bodies be buried outside of the city or put into the catacombs deep, 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 deep under the city. But more often than not, most people were cremated. And so this tended to cut down on disease. And, um, and so the city of Rome itself was fairly well protected from diseases. But as we all know, Rome was not just the city proper. Okay, the Roman Empire was massive, stretching from the British Isles to North Africa into the Middle East, and Romans participated in trade networks that expanded even beyond all of that. So they're not really isolated or insulated uh, from these diseases. So going all the way back to the first century BC, we hear of Romans coming into contact with malaria, um, and this is in large part a result of their trade networks uh, with Africa, especially their trade networks to get gold and grain. And so um, we know that they uh, came down with malaria. Um, we also know that uh, they experienced a series of plagues coming in from the east, possibly coming from the Huns who were traveling from China at that time. And um, they just refer to them as the plagues. And that's all we really know about them. So we do know that they're coming into contact with certain diseases, but that it's not something that really plagued them on a regular basis here. And oh, and I got a question about the uh, life expectancy for an average Roman. Um, so if you were an average Roman living in the city proper, uh, your life expectancy was going to be much, much higher than someone who was living, say, in Germania uh, at the time there. And um, so when it, even at that, it's still fairly low. So um, generally speaking, people averaged out to living to be in their 30s, but I should preface that by saying that that's when we take the infant mortality rate into consideration. So the infant mortality rate tends to skew all of that downward. Um, and so if we start counting people after they reach the age of two, then um, they can actually expect fairly uh, comparable lifespans to ours today. It's not unusual for a Roman to live to be in their 60s, 70s, 80s, or even older than that. Um, and so, uh, so they actually have pretty uh, long lifespans in comparison with most of the people around them. And, um, and this is at least in part because of, of sanitation. And, um, and so uh, despite all of that, Rome, again, is not totally insulated from diseases. And in fact, um, we see the first disease of truly epidemic proportions uh, occurring in 166 AD. And this is the Antonine Plague. And so the Antonine Plague was named after uh, the emperor Antoninus 
pious under whose leadership it first began. And um, we know that it started somewhere in the East and had a devastating effect on, um, on the Romans and particularly with the barbarian hordes entering into the empire during this time uh, because it was killing off so many Roman soldiers. And the Antonine Plague is yet another example of that war plague connection because the Romans were at war with the Parthians in the east at this time. And if uh, you're unfamiliar with the Parthians, you can think of them as the successors to the old Persian Achaemenid, uh, uh, Achaemenid Empire. And, um, and so they're at war with the Parthians at this time, and um, they start noticing that their soldiers are dropping like flies in the east. And unfortunately for the co emperor. So after uh, Antoninus Pius, we have co-emperors Marcus Aurelius and Luke, uh, Lucius Verus. The co-emperor Lucius Verus is sent to the east to check out the situation. And unfortunately for Lucius Verus, he comes down with the disease while he's there. And he's actually accompanied by um, one of the most famous uh, physicians in all of history. So you may have heard of Galen before. So Galen, you can actually see in the uh, picture that's in the middle of the, uh, the slide right there. So Galen and other physicians administering to, uh, to plague victims there. So Galen not only gets to be a, an eyewitness to the Antonine Plague, he gets to be an eyewitness to the emperor coming down with the plague. And um, Galen describes all of the symptoms of this disease in detail. So saying that people experienced a fever, inflammation of the mouth and throat, parching thirst, um, diarrhea. And then by the time they get to um, the ninth day, they start to experience skin eruptions. And he implies that most people died before they even got to the skin eruptions. But um, once you get to those, if you manage to survive the skin eruptions, you're good. Okay, after that, you are safe, but most people die before all of that. And so we see Galen describing all of this, Lucius Verus getting this disease. Lucius Verus ends up dying uh, of the Antonine Plague, and the plague starts sweeping across the Roman Empire, heading in from the east, uh, heading across the Mediterranean. We have soldiers who came down with it in the east who are then heading back to Rome. Uh, and then being stationed in other parts of the empire as well. So these soldiers act as vectors just infecting everyone else in the empire there. And um, ultimately, the other co-emperor, Marcus Aurelius, comes down with the disease as well and ends up succumbing to it. Um, and just as a testament to Marcus Aurelius's character, as he is lying in his deathbed, surrounded by the best doctors uh, in the entire empire there, he um, dismisses them. And he says, weep not for me, think rather of the pestilence and the deaths of so many others. So he's telling them just, I, I'm old, I'm gonna die anyway. And so take care of everyone else instead. And, um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so we see this Antonine plague breaking out throughout Rome, decimating their, uh, their military, decimating their workforce as well, because it's much more likely to be spread among soldiers and among poor workers and slaves at this time. And if you're wondering, well, what was this? What was this crazy disease that was spreading all throughout Rome? This is one of them where we're much more sure of what it was much, much more sure. Uh, we're almost positive that this was smallpox. Okay, so this was almost certainly smallpox. For years and years, uh, historians and epidemiologists went back and forth about this disease, debating whether it was a really virulent uh, form of measles or whether it was smallpox. And the two of them are somewhat related to one another. And the reason that they went with measles is, at first is because of how rapidly it spread, because smallpox doesn't spread quite 
quite as easily as measles does. And so if we're looking at the rapid spread of this disease, it kind of makes sense. But um, after doing uh, additional studies on this, they realized that measles wasn't around at that point in history. So measles actually developed sometime around 1100 or so. And so it's not possible that it was a disease that broke out in 166 uh, CE. And so that leads them to believe that it was smallpox, but it spread really, really rapidly because of the close quarters that these soldiers were sleeping in and operating in, and it was more likely to spread amongst the poor because they lived in closer quarters with each other. Uh, and so we have this disease spreading across the empire there, um, and, uh, and you could argue that it was something that paved the way for the decline of Rome. But the plague that really put the nail in the coffin for Rome was actually the plague of Cyprian. So in about 250 AD, a plague broke out in Rome and um, just changed the course of history and Western civilization and may have expedited the downfall of the Roman Empire. So this plague is named after a Carthaginian bishop, Cyprian, who had written about it, which I don't know how one would feel about that, having a plague named after them just because they had the gall to write about it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's named after him because this plague uh, may have started somewhere in uh, North Africa. And so it affected much of North Africa before spreading into uh, the rest throughout the rest of the Mediterranean and into the rest of the Roman Empire. And um, Cyprian describes this plague as causing um, violent diarrhea and vomiting, uh, ulcerated uh, sore throat, burning fever, and gangrene in the hands and feet, along with a sort of uh, unquenchable thirst. And, um, and so uh, historians and epidemiologists have had a really tough time trying to figure out what this was. In fact, one of the theories about this disease was that it was a very virulent uh, form of ergotism. So ergotism is a fungus or ergot is a fungus that affects rye primarily. And if you consume the affected rye, uh, this fungus there, then you come down with ergotism, which was also called St. Anthony's fire. And um, when you come down with this, you feel like you are on fire. Your insides start to burn. You start to hallucinate. It is a miserable, miserable experience. But it would have had to have been a very, very, very virulent uh, version of ergotism because ergotism isn't typically quite that deadly. And the plague of Cyprian was the deadliest pandemic recorded up to that date in history with uh, Roman historians uh, remarking that it was killing about 5,000 people every single day. Okay, 5,000 people every single day, which is just astronomical, especially when we consider the fact that the Roman population was around roughly um, 60 million at this time. And um, the plague of Cyprian may have ultimately killed about five to six million people. So that's that's pretty, pretty significant. Uh, and so this is the plague that, again, may have led to the death downfall of Rome, because uh, similar to the Antonine Plague, it's mostly killing poorer people, all right? It's mostly uh, decimating their slave population, uh, which was just the backbone of the Roman economy at this time. It's decimating their soldiers as well. And so it's very difficult for the Romans to guard the, uh, the borders of the empire. It's difficult for them to fend off attacks from barbarians at this time because of this disease. And so um, on this slide, I have a couple of pictures um, examples, particularly from the plague of Cyprian. So what you're seeing in these pictures are artifacts that were found in parts of Egypt and um, modern day Sudan. 
and uh, they show plague victims and funeral pyres. So what we know of the plague of Cyprian is that the response to this was actually uh, incredibly effective in terms of containing the disease once they realized that there was a problem. Uh, they usually burned the bodies. So they would typically take disease victims and immediately put them into the pyres uh, and burn them, which is what you're seeing in the bottom picture to the right. And uh, in the top picture to the right, you can actually see little oil lamps uh, that were found near these funeral pyres here. And not only were they burning the bodies uh, to get rid of this plague, but they were also uh, burning all of the belongings of all of these people. So it's not just you that's going into the pyre, but all of your clothing, all of your possessions, basically everything you've touched needs to go into the pyre here to try to control this disease. Um, and so it's, again, one of the more effective responses that we see to all of this, uh, at least in the ancient world, and um, arguably a bit more effective than what we see later on during the Black Death. And um, let's see, I think I had, uh, let's see. Oh, I had some questions in the comments there about um, a warm, wet climate in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and so, uh, you had asked if they had the same sorts of issues in places like South America or South Asia. And the answer to that is yes and no, okay? The reason I say yes and no there is because um, because human civilization started in sub-Saharan Africa, the diseases that are developing there have a lot longer to get used to us and figure out our weaknesses. And so we play this back and forth game of being infected by a disease, developing immunity, the disease is getting stronger, and then we keep going back and forth, back and forth. So you usually see much, much, much more virulent uh, diseases coming out of sub-Saharan Africa because it's the cradle of civilization. However, when we look at um, places in South uh, Asia or South America, usually once those diseases that first developed with human beings in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa are spread there, they take off like wildfire. All right, so because it's a perfect environment for them. And so they are very, very conducive to these particular types of diseases there. And um, and then let's see, uh, oh, and uh, someone had asked about the caption. Oh, I think that they might've asked before we talked a little bit about this. And, uh, and so um, I also had a question about why it was that burning uh, bodies was very effective in controlling the transmission. So so that's a good question because um, it brings into question whether this disease was actually coming from ergotism. That's one of the reasons why historians and epidemiologists question this in the first place because ergotism wouldn't have been spread person to person here. It would have been spread from eating uh, the contaminated food instead. And so, um, so basically it uh, brings up more questions than it answers. Uh, essentially. So we, we don't really know exactly what this is. In fact, most historians err on the side of just saying, we don't know. It's better to not know and not guess than it is to just speculate about all of this. Um, and so now I want to get into our very first instance of uh, plague, so bubonic plague. And But first, I'm going to check my time. One second and make sure that I'm not going well over all of this because I get really excited about uh, talking about diseases and it, the temptation is definitely there to go over time, uh, but we're still doing very well. Um, and so we've talked about diseases in the prehistoric uh, prehistorical period. We've talked about them in the Bronze Age, classical uh, Greece and Rome. And now I want to shift the focus on to Byzantium. Okay, so talking a little bit uh, about the Byzantines here. Um, when we, uh, after the experience of the fall of the Western Roman Empire, we see the rise of Byzantium and or the Eastern Roman Empire. And um, 
perhaps its most famous or maybe even notorious rulers uh, is Justinian, also called Justinian the Great, even though his chronicler uh, Procopius would probably argue with all of that. So Justinian's reign began in a blaze of glory with castles been, being built, forts being built, magnificent churches uh, being built, and um, he's recruiting one of the most well-trained armies uh, commanded by some of the most successful generals in all of history. And with all of this, he manages to reconquer much of the Western Roman Empire and make the Mediterranean into a Roman sea once again. And so it looks like Justinian is doing a great job and that things are going very, very well for him. But unfortunately, um, something happens around 540 AD uh, that mars his record, among many other uh, things as well, which I won't get into today. But something that mars his record is an outbreak of plague. And so when Justinian was going on expeditions to the West to reconquer uh, the empire, he had left Constantinople uh, fairly vulnerable. So so vulnerable to attack. And the, uh, the Byzantines had been feuding with the Persians for years and years and years. And so it's during this time when Justinian's army is heading west that the Persians take this opportunity to invade Constantinople. And, um, and so during this invasion, and again, you'll note connection between war and pestilence here. So during this invasion, we see the outbreak of a disease and perhaps the beginning of the first true pandemic in world history. Up to this point, you could argue that we've talked about epidemics, all right? So small-ish outbreaks um, within a certain state, within um, maybe even a certain part of an empire there. But the first true pandemic uh, is arguably the Justinianic plague. And the reason that I say that is because it becomes the first major pandemic to substantially affect all three of the uh, all three continents of the uh, the old world, and um, this was a virulent form of plague at that, uh, killing about forty percent of the population in Constantinople, and um, possibly killing anywhere from twenty five to fifty million people uh, globally. And it's quite possible that those numbers are even higher than that. But we have issues with the record keeping at the time. So it's, it's very difficult to know exactly how many people uh, the Justinianic plague killed. Uh, but Procopius, who was writing on all of this, seemed to think that this was going to be it. It's curtains for humanity. This is the disease that is going to wipe out all of human civilization. And he had good reason to think all of that. So Procopius is kind of similar to Thucydides in so far as he is an eyewitness to, uh, to the outbreak of this, uh, this disease. And he documents it along the way. And Procopius describes the symptoms of this disease he describes the factors that are kind of leading up to all of it. And one of the most unique things about the Justinianic plague is that it actually starts with an episodic. OK, so if you think about an epidemic as being an outbreak of disease among people, if we're focusing on an episodic, that is an outbreak of disease among animals. And so um, before the disease spreads to people, uh, they remark on this episodic among rats. So um, throughout the streets of Constantinople, people started to notice that rats were dying. There were just dead rats all over the streets. There were dead rats 
floating in all of the waterways. And people started thinking, what's going on here? Why are there dead rats literally everywhere? So it was kind of a creepy apocalyptic scene right there before the disease even got started on the human population. And so um, we now believe that once the disease had killed off uh, much of the rat population in Constantinople, the fleas that were on the rats didn't really have anywhere else to go. And so they start jumping on to other animals. So jumping on to other animals and jumping on to people as well. And um, once they start jumping on to people, they start spreading uh, this disease. And the specific disease that they were spreading was a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. So the plague bacteria. And as soon as people came, became infected with this plague bacteria, they would come down with the, the usual. So they'd come down with the fever. Uh, they would start sweating. Um, they also remark that people would start to hallucinate as well and, um, and that they would be incredibly thirsty and then eventually they would get these little skin eruptions which we now know as buboes all right so skin eruptions around their lymph nodes and we're going to be talking about some of the symptoms of bubonic plague in much more detail a little bit later when we get to the black death but um, so far this is what we know about uh, the disease that hit Constantinople and by extension the rest of the Byzantine Empire but not only that, um, we're talking about all of the Mediterranean, we're talking about North Africa being hit, uh, we're also talking about um, much of the Middle East being hit by this, and uh, China as well. So this was a true pandemic that affected more or less all of human civilization in the old world. And, um, and this is something that completely changed the trajectory of history. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So um, <clears throat> when we think about the early Middle Ages, um, the early Middle Ages, particularly the sixth century here, one of the most notable things that happens during that time is that the Anglo-Saxons end up moving into England and taking over. You could argue that we wouldn't have had England as we know it without those Anglo-Saxons heading in there. But the only reason they were able to do that is because of the plague of Justinian. So the plague of Justinian spread into the uh, English uh, port cities like uh, Londinium there and killed off the Roman population that was living there. The population that may have been able to defend uh, Britannia or modern day England from the Anglo-Saxons. And so without the plague of Justinian, there may have been no Anglo-Saxon England. But something that is arguably even more significant than all of that is there may have been no Islamic conquest without the plague of Justinian because um, this plague weakened Byzantium and weakened the old Persian empire and made it possible for, the, uh, for us to see the rise of Islam and the spread of Islam throughout the Arabian Peninsula into the old Persian empire, into the outskirts of the Byzantine Empire and throughout the Mediterranean. And so the timing for the Islamic conquest was perfect in this case here because the Byzantines and the Persians found it difficult to um, mount a counterattack or defend themselves here. And so if that had happened even a few centuries before that, um, we may not have seen Islam spreading uh, at the speed uh, or um, spreading as far as, as we see it at this time. And so the plague of Justinian or Justinianic plague, again, has far reaching effects here. And, um, and so I had a question about 
the spread of the uh, Justinianic plague here. And um, yes, it was very, very similar to the spread of the Black Death. Uh, so spreading from rats uh, and the fleas specifically, jumping from the rats onto the people, spreading throughout the Mediterranean, because at this point, the Byzantines are very, very well connected uh, throughout the Mediterranean and throughout basically the entirety of the old world. And and oftentimes these rats would be on grain ships that were going to and from uh, cities in the Mediterranean there. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, so it definitely spread in a very, very similar way. Oh, and I had another question about why weren't the Muslim armies affected by the same plague which had decimated the Byzantines? So one of the reasons for that is because Islam was first developing in Saudi Arabia, and the plague uh, does not travel well in dry air. OK, so it doesn't travel very well in dry, uh, hot air, for that matter. It actually spreads a bit better in moist, colder air, which is one of the reasons why it was so virulent at this time, uh, because there was a cold front uh, throughout the world during this period here, a cold front that was actually caused by uh, a volcano going off in Central America, putting ash up into the sky. And so the temperature dropped at this time and it's easier for the plague to spread in colder environments so it doesn't spread well uh in saudi or uh, saudi arabia and so that's part of the reason why and um another reason why uh we don't really see that among muslims is because for the most part the plague had already come and gone uh by the time that we see the rise of islam but it had done its damage uh to byzantium and to uh and to the Persian Empire, because we see Islam starting to spread towards the end of uh, towards the end of the sixth and early seventh century, and so they kind of missed uh, that one, just dodged the bullet uh, on that one, and so um, so now I want to get into why why on earth this plague was so awful all right what are some of the factors that went into this now that we've talked about some of the historical precedents uh for plagues we're going to get into the specifics of um the 1300s all right so the 14th century and why it is that this particular plague the black death is so much worse than any of the plagues that we see before because we've already seen that there's been an outbreak of bubonic plague with the Justinianic plague, but it begs the question of, well, why is it that the one in the 14th century is so much worse than this one? What factors go into all of that? And um, and so, and speaking of that, I actually had a question about um, were these historic diseases stopped through herd immunity? In some cases, they were stopped through herd immunity. It depends on the individual disease there, but there are some instances where it's stopped because it it just kills so many people that the disease has to stop because it has no more hosts. That's what we often see in hemorrhagic viruses like Ebola, for example. Um, but when it comes to things like the plague here, uh, you could actually develop immunity to it. And so we're going to be talking a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. And, um, and so to start with the 14th century and the factors that are leading up to the plague, I want to discuss sanitation because sanitation is so unbelievably important for understanding um, why it was so bad. We've already talked a little bit about Roman uh, sanitation and how Romans were just the paragons of cleanliness in comparison to people living in the Middle Ages. But unfortunately, um, Roman standards of cleanliness start to drop off in the sixth century. And you could even make the argument that this was related to one event. So in 541, the Goths besieged Rome. And as part of the siege there, they decided to destroy the aqueducts. So destroy parts of the aqueducts and cut them off from their clean water supply. And so after the Goths do this, the Romans start to just descend 
tend to squalor um, because water is absolutely integral to sanitation. And it seems that they don't really recover uh, after that. So they don't really get back up to that standard that we see in the first few centuries of Imperial Rome. And unfortunately, Rome was the standard bearer for cleanliness. Everybody else in Western Europe and other parts of the former Roman Empire took their cues from Rome about how they were supposed to uh, supposed to live their lives, how they were supposed to um, dress or bathe or whatever. And if things start to decline in Rome, then that means that they start to decline everywhere else as well. And so we really see this drop off in about uh, the sixth century here, just this fall from grace. And um, in addition to all of that, um, in the early Middle Ages, people abandoned some of the Roman practices of of, well, city planning. So city planning is something that we kind of take for granted. Most of us don't really think about how important city planning is in our daily lives, but it's something that could very well be uh, keeping us alive. Uh, so when we think about the Romans and the way that they planned cities, more often than not, Romans tended to use orthogonal plans. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, think of it as the grid system. In fact, if you drive into Washington, D.C., you'll notice that it is orthogonally planned. So it's a grid system with state names and um, numbers and letters and all of that. And this grid system actually aided in sanitation. So it provided ventilation in between all of the buildings. It provided easy access uh, to water and also access in the case of, say, fires or other catastrophes and things like that. And so in addition to this orthogonal planning, Romans also had, of course, indoor plumbing and, uh, and they had sewage systems. But all of this just falls out of favor in the early Middle Ages. But some of the Roman infrastructure is still there. It's just that medieval people tend to just build on top of it. All right. So the good infrastructure might be there, but medieval people start building little tenements and things like that on top of these old Roman ruins or Roman buildings. And they don't really take city planning into consideration here. Uh, so you don't see these orthogonally planned cities anymore. You don't see these um, sewage systems or indoor plumbing. If you are lucky, then in the early Middle Ages, you might live in a city that has a large open sewer, okay? open sewer. That is if you are very, very lucky. In most of these medieval towns, they didn't even have that. People just threw their refuse out into the middle of the yard, the middle of the street. It's just everywhere you went, there was human muck, or, or animal muck just all over the place. And you're lucky if you have some stepping stones in between. And so we see this sort of crisis of uh, human and animal waste all over the place. And that's pretty normal throughout much of uh, of the Middle Ages. Now, in addition to this problem with sanitation uh, out in the streets, we have to talk about their houses and some of the building materials that they were using. So on this slide, you can see a thatched roof house. And of course, today we associate thatched roof houses with the Cotswolds in England. It's uh, where all of the creme de la creme of celebrities want to live because it's just so quaint and adorable. Um, but in actuality, um, thatched roof houses are a public health nightmare, okay? An absolute nightmare. And the reason for that is because lots of creatures like to live in thatched roofs. In fact, vermin live in thatched roofs, lots and lots of rats. And so this was so common for rats to live in thatched roofs that um, we have sources of um, from peasants who say that they just go to sleep one night and in the middle of the night a rat would drop down from the ceiling and smack them in the face and then they just kind of move it off and go back to sleep 
All right. And if you're sitting here thinking, oh, that's, that is not how I would react to that. Uh, if a rat drops out of the ceiling and lands on my face, I'm going to be traumatized. In fact, my life will henceforth be divided into pre-rat and post-rat periods. So it's kind of a big deal to us, but it was normal back then. So they have thatched roofs that um, don't really provide good vent uh, ventilation and serve as houses for lots and lots and lots of vermin. On top of all of that, it was pretty normal for uh, medieval people, especially peasants, to sleep with their animals in their homes, not only in their homes, but in their beds so that they could stay warm. So you go to sleep at night and you might be having a um, sheep in your bed with you or a cow sitting beside you or five dogs on top of you. Um, that was normal so that you could keep warm. But unfortunately, that also means that you get all of their pests and parasites and things like that along with it. And so, um, so we have problems with the housing situation there. And, um, and oh, and you said, is it raining cats and dogs? So it is kind of similar to uh, the phrase that it's raining cats and dogs. It did rain rats on top of them. And if you've heard the phrase three dog night, um, then that actually comes from this practice of sleeping with your animals so that you can stay warm. So anytime that it's really, really cold, you say, oh, it's a three dog night. I've got to really pile the animals in here to keep me warm. And, um, and so I, uh, oh, and the hygiene of European and uh, let's see, uh, medieval hygiene with Eastern cultures. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about that uh, when we get to information on the Silk Road. We'll actually go into some of the, uh, the comparisons, contrasts with Eastern cultures, uh, particularly Arab cultures here. So we will get into that uh, a little bit later. And, um, and so the last little thing I want to mention about hygiene here is that um, while people are living in absolute squalor, the people themselves are not as disgusting as you might think. In fact, um, oftentimes pop, uh, popular culture, movies, for example, show medieval people as just being covered in uh, mud and feces with their teeth rotting out. Um, I always think about Monty Python and the Holy Grail here whenever I think about these medieval people just living in the mud. Um, but that's not really true. In fact, um, even poorer people in the Middle Ages, even peasants, valued cleanliness. They didn't always have the ability to be as clean as they wanted to be, but we do have evidence that peasants would try to wash their hands and their faces before meals. And if they had had access to baths, they would have taken them. And the reason that we know this is because the aristocracy bathed regularly throughout the Middle Ages. So um, one of the most common misconceptions that I often hear from my students is, well, I've heard about um, kings and queens in Europe bragging that they only took one bath in their entire lives. So I thought nobody bathed in the Middle Ages. And that's actually a practice that doesn't really come about until after the Black Death and is largely a response to the Black Death. So throughout most of the Middle Ages, the um, baths are aspirational. People want to be able to bathe and wealthy people absolutely do bathe. And in some ways, um, wealthy people in the Middle Ages had some things going for them that even the Romans didn't. Um, so they had soap. So soap had not yet been invented in ancient Rome. So when Romans were taking baths, they often used oil in order to emulsify all of the dirt and grime on themselves, and then they would scrape everything off. But soap was invented sometime around the 7th or 8th century, so people in the Middle Ages had soap to use. We also have evidence that they used um, the various types of deodorants made out of herbs, and that there was 
was a um, very lucrative perfume market at this time, particularly after the Crusades, when they come into contact with different spices and perfumes and things from the Middle East. So people were much, much cleaner at this time than we often give them credit for. But the conditions in which they are living are pretty disgusting. Um, and so uh, now, since it is, let's see, 1059, and I only have five minutes or so, I want to just stop and see if there are some questions for the last five minutes, because in the next lecture, we're going to get into some of the other factors leading up to the Black Death, start talking about the plague itself. Uh, and then in the lecture following that, we'll be talking about the consequences of the plague and getting into more modern uh, plagues as well. But for the time being, uh, do I have any questions? or questions about the history of epidemics or um, sanitation in Western Europe. So, well, actually, if there aren't questions about that, I could go ahead and um, answer the question about the comparison between um, hygiene in Western Europe and uh, hygiene that we see in other Eastern cultures there. So we know that in the early Middle Ages, um, we see this sort of enlightenment going on in uh, the Middle East. We see the Islamic Golden Age. And as part of the Islamic Golden Age, we see a newfound interest in cleanliness, especially cleanliness that's associated with medicine. So it was kind of common knowledge at this time uh, in the early Middle Ages that if you were going to go to a doctor or if you were going to have surgery, you wanted to go to a Muslim doctor, not a Christian one. All right, you want to go to a Muslim doctor because they had higher standards of cleanliness and they tended to clean bodies with uh, vinegar before they started to operate on them. And so we tend to see slightly higher standards uh, in the Middle East at this time. But I should say that this is primarily among wealthier people, which seems to be the case for uh, most civilizations that you're much more likely to see this uh, among wealthier people. And, um, and so let's see. Uh, oh, we'll be talking about, uh, to answer some of your questions in the chat, we'll be talking about whether these diseases uh, become endemic a little bit later on. And you could make the argument that the plague does become endemic at least for a little while. Uh, and so we will be getting into that for, uh, for a little bit. And, um, and let's see. Oh, I had a question about the early uh, flushable toilets there. So we have evidence of pay urinals uh, in the middle of the Roman Forum. So you would actually have to bring a coin up to use these public toilets. And, um, and more often than not, if they were public toilets, what they involved were benches with holes in them. And underneath the benches, there was running water. And so the water would be running kind of fresh from the aqueducts through these little trenches there and then into the sewer system. And so when you went to the restroom in ancient Rome, we'll say, for example, at the Colosseum, the Colosseum had public restrooms. Oftentimes people would go together and it would be social hour. Uh, so they would actually sit right in next to one another on these benches and um, just chat uh, while they were going to the restroom. And so they were able to flush the water out with the running water underneath them. And we see similar uh, things within uh, Roman aristocrats' homes. So they would actually have water reservoirs that were stored up from uh, their pipes that were connected to the aqueducts. And, um, and you could do something to the equivalent of pulling a lever or a chain and having water run through your toilet and flush uh, the waste out into the sewers. Uh, 
And um, and let's see. Oh, and I had a question about uh, did troop movements associated with the Crusades uh, affect the spread of the plague? And I would say that it's um, that as far as troop movements are concerned, that the plague in the uh, 14th century was much more affected by troop movements in the Hundred Years' War uh, than it was in the Crusades. So as far as troop movement or movement of the plague from, say, the Middle East into, uh, into Europe, it was more associated with trade uh, at this time. But we'll get into some of the details of that a little bit later as well. Uh, so did I, I thought I saw a hand up at some point. Uh, did I have another question? Uh, yes. Uh, when you're talking about city planning and sewers, there was an article in the Washington Post recently saying that in D.C., the rainwater mixes with the sewage. And on heavy days of heavy rain, they're asking people not to flush toilets, not to take showers and not to wash clothes on rainy days because it's flooding the sewage, sewers and the, the rivers and the, and, and, and the water is now... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. carrying disease. Oh my gosh. Wow. I had not read that one, but that's, uh, that is fascinating. Who knew that we had not really come very far or maybe the Romans were ahead of us on this one. Oh my gosh. Well, that's interesting. Uh, and, um, and yeah, we're, uh, oh, were there other questions? I also saw other hands raised as well. If anyone else has a question or comment, feel free to raise your hand. Let's see, I see a lot of raised hands. So any questions? Um, good morning, this is Plenary F. Stalter. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. It was yeah. excellently portrayed and um, I have learned so much. So I really thank you. I know putting something together like this takes time. And I also know that our fabulous compensation is just saying thanks. So well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I enjoy it. So yeah, no, no skin off my back there. I love reading about all of the nitty gritty of uh, ancient diseases. So, um, so yeah, but thank you. Well, I hope you come back. Mm -hmm. Well, will do. And definitely uh, for the next two lectures there. So you can stick around for those. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And oh, and I had a question in the chat there. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, about the rainwater caused by co uh, combining the piping system, separating them from. Oh, OK. So uh, uh, it was a comment on the, the rainwater systems there. And, um, and any other questions? Let's see. And, um, oh, oh, and thank you very much. And um, to my knowledge, this is being recorded um, and will be available on YouTube. Uh, so you will be able to revisit, if, uh, revisit it if you would like. Um, and let's see, um, are there any other questions about any of this? Hi, I do have a comment. Yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you. This has been fascinating. So again, I echo the previous comments. And my, my statement is, I'm presently reading a book about the second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And one of the constant themes in the book is the putrid smelling canal right in the middle of DC where a lot of garbage and sanitation waste goes into. Mm -hmm. And it just echoes your comments about, you know, just a lack of sanitation throughout history. And it's just fascinating, you know, even in the 1860s, where they did not adopt any of the Roman technology in D.C. And oh. it was a constant complaint by yeah. everybody, which is why Lincoln would often go, uh, you know, exit and go to officer quarters further uptown just to get away from it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that around that same time, uh, we had a similar situation going on in London. Right. Uh, a, it was called the Great Stink, which is one of my 
favorite names, favorite names for an event in all of history, the Great Stink. I believe it was in about 1858. And um, it was a result of lack of sanitation and industrial pollution going into the Thames. And it turned the river into basically gravy. Uh, they described it as gravy that was bubbling up uh, on a really hot day. And it smelled so bad that the smell just wafted all the way over to Parliament and finally caught their attention and basically forced politicians to do something about it. Because before that, uh, the effects of or the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution had mostly been affecting poor or working class people who lived near all of that. But now that it's bad enough that it wafts over to Parliament, they realize they have to completely and totally overhaul their system there. So so, uh, so yeah, tons of examples from the uh, 19th and now even the 20th century here where we haven't learned our lessons from the Romans, sadly enough. So um, <coughs> any other questions? Oh. Uh, Bonnie, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I have a friend who had the bubonic plague when he was in Vietnam in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wondered if you talk about, you know, modern day if when you get to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will be talking about uh, some modern examples of the plague because I know when I, I, I present this to my students uh, at NOVA, many of them are unaware that it still exists. So there's still plague out there. And um, and so we will be getting into modern outbreaks. We'll be getting into uh, whether it's even a threat uh, in the United States, how much plague is present here and where you might get plague in the US or which places on uh, in the world are much more susceptible to plague outbreaks. So we will be getting into all of that, but that's fascinating. I've never actually met someone who had the plague and I would love to pick their brain. So yeah. He's right in Fairfax in Burke. Oh, um, okay. so I can see about that. Okay. Uh, what I can do, but this is so fascinating. I, I really thank you. Um, you've really enlightened us a lot and I'm looking forward to your next session. All right. Well, thank you. And I am looking forward to it as well. And um, oh, and you guys have so much information in the chats there about um, the sewer systems within uh, the United States there. You probably know a lot more about this than I do. So I know much more about Roman sewer systems than uh, than in the U.S. here. Um, and oh, and I had another question or a hand raise. This is Helen Lino. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the, this is being recorded. Uh, will all the sessions be recorded? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Uh, all of the sessions will be recorded uh, and available on YouTube. Mm -hmm. On YouTube. So we, will we just type in the Black Death to get that on YouTube? Hmm. You know, um, I would actually have to ask uh, Ollie about that. Uh, um, Nancy, do you know how uh, how students would be able to access that? We'll, we'll make sure it's also on the Ollie member website. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay, and some other questions as well? I think there's one more in the Q&A and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see. So um, in the chat there, I saw uh, a comment about the, um, the drainage systems in the U.S. there. Uh, and let's see, are there other questions or did I miss some? No, I, I believe that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, well, I am looking forward to the next session there um, and chatting with everybody on election day. Uh, so I guess we'll all stick around and see everyone uh, next week. <laughs>